Hi, my name's Liz Rice and I am delighted to be back here at P99Conf. I hope you're all enjoying some great talks about performance. I'm going to be discussing the performance overhead of networking between containers and how close we can come to eliminating that overhead by using eBPF to help us forward packets more efficiently. And I'll also be talking about a recent development in the kernel, which introduces a new virtual device type called NetKit. I'm Liz Rice. I work at ISOvalent, now part of Cisco since our acquisition earlier this year. I've been involved in the world of containers and cloud native for quite a few years now, and I've been focusing on eBPF, which I think is an amazing technology for lots of infrastructure tooling like observability, security, and of course, networking. I'm lucky enough to work with lots of really talented and knowledgeable eBPF and kernel developers on the ISOvalent team, including Daniel Borkman, who is responsible for a lot of the improvements that I'm going to be describing today. I also want to credit him for the benchmark results that I'll be showing you. And the first of those is showing the container networking overhead that we're concerned about in this talk. So this bar chart shows the throughput of a single TCP stream of tra traffic over 100 gigabit Ethernet connection. When the application is running directly on the host machine, we get pretty close to that wire speed of 100 gigabits. But when we put the application inside a container, we only see about two thirds of that throughput. So what are the differences that cause this drop off in performance? In what we'll call traditional pre-container networking, we run the application directly on the host and it sends and receives packets over a network socket. Those packets are handled by the kernel's networking stack, which does things like figure out how to route the packet, that is, where to send it next. In this example, egress traffic from the application gets routed out over the ethernet connection to the wire and ingress traffic gets sent over the socket to the application. When we introduce containers, we deliberately isolate our applications from one another and from the underlying host. And that typically includes giving them their own network namespace so that the container's networking stack is separated from that of the host. The two network namespaces are connected by a virtual Ethernet connection. Either side of that connection, there's a virtual Ethernet device, which looks just like a regular network device with a virtual MAC address. So even things like ARP resolution are happening across this virtual connection that connects the host to the container. So packets going to or from a containerized application actually have to pass through the network stack twice, once on the host and once inside the container's network namespace. There is some overhead associated with simply handling it twice, but that's not actually the biggest problem that we saw in that 100 gigabit benchmarking. At high traffic speeds, there's a more significant problem of TCP back pressure breakage, where socket send buffer limits can be evaded in the upper networking stack, which leads to packets getting dropped, and then the congestion control algorithm kicks in and significantly reduces the throughput. So if we could avoid packets being handled by the upper networking stack, we could avoid these TCP back pressure breakages. When you see this diagram, it might bring to mind other talks you might have seen about Cilium project and how it streamlines Kubernetes networks by eliminating a component called kubeproxy and using eBPF programs to replace kubeproxy's use of IP tables rules. Those IP tables rules can get really inefficient at scale. But that's a separate story. In this talk, we're not using Kubernetes. We're not using Kubernetes in this benchmark. And instead, we're going to look at how eBPF programs can now be used to bypass the host routing that up till now has always been done 
within that upper networking stack. We can do host routing with eBPF thanks to two new eBPF helper functions that were introduced into the kernel in version 5.10. The first of these helper functions is BPF redirect peer. And this can be used within eBPF programs attached at traffic control ingress. And it can switch a packet directly into the container's network namespace. So it appears as if it were arriving over that virtual wire to the virtual Ethernet device inside the container. And for egress traffic, there's a helper function called BPF redirect neighbor that can take uh, an egress packet, finds its destination address, looks up that destination ad address directly in the kernel's FIB or forwarding information base. So it's using the same routing information that the kernel would use. And it looks up the next hop towards that destination address. This helper function can also fill in the layer two addressing into the packet and send the packet out to the right network interface. So if we combine the picture for both ingress and egress, you can see that we're bypassing the upper network stack on the host by doing all that host routing in eBPF programs. And this significantly improves the performance. We're now getting about 90 gigabits, as you can see in that middle bar in the chart. So we're getting much closer to the baseline host network performance. But there must be something else that's holding us back. And what that is, is illustrated in this flame graph. Under load, the network stack can't always send a packet in the context of the application thread. Packets might get put onto a per CPU queue and get deferred and sent later uh, by the kernel's soft interrupt daemon. Now with BPF host routing or with eBPF programs doing the host routing, this doesn't happen for ingress packets because that BPF redirect peer helper function can skip any per CPU queuing. The packet can be forwarded before there's any possibility of it getting queued. But in the egress direction, packets can still get put on a backlog queue in the container's virtual ethernet device. This is a problem that occurs because we can't attach eBPF programs inside the container. And that's because you need elevated privileges to load and attach eBPF programs. And as a general rule, you don't want containers to have those privileges. But if we want to avoid that backlog queuing, we'll need to be able to attach eBPF programs to the network device inside the container. In order to solve that problem, there first needed to be a complete rework of the way eBPF programs are attached within the TC or traffic control subsystem of the networking stack. The rework is called TCX or Traffic Control Express, and this landed in kernel version 6.6 .6 in 2023. TCX delivers a much better way of attaching and ordering multiple eBPF programs that can be attached at the TC layer. And it adds BPF link support so that those eBPF programs can be managed properly. And I have some diagrams that give you a sense of how TCX simplifies and streamlines things. In the old design before 6.6, .6, you had to create a fake queue disk or queuing discipline that doesn't actually do any queuing and simply exists as somewhere for eBPF programs to be attached. In the new design, there's a new BPF multi-program array attached much more directly to TC at either ingress or egress. The result of this streamlining is that as well as making it possible to properly manage and order multiple programs within TC, it's also more performant. The micro benchmark shows a reduction to around half the number of CPU cycles used before a BPF program is entered. 
So TCX does help with the performance. But really, more importantly, it was laying the groundwork for the final piece of the puzzle, which is the introduction of NetKit devices, which Daniel added to the kernel pretty much exactly a year ago. Daniel described these as minimal BPF programmable devices. Like virtual Ethernet devices, these NetKit devices come in pairs, one inside the host network namespace, known as the primary, and one inside the containers network namespace called a peer. Only the primary on the host side is able to manage eBPF programs because, as I mentioned earlier, you don't want containers managing eBPF programs. But the primary is able to attach eBPF programs into its peer. So by replacing those virtual Ethernet devices with NetKit devices, we can redirect packets in both the ingress and egress directions, switching them into the correct network namespace immediately. So we can skip that backlog queue in both directions. And if we compare the flame graph with NetKit, the packet gets redirected in the context of the application thread. This uses less CPU, but it also helps the kernel's process scheduler make better decisions because it's better able to account for the time required by the application to send packets. And if we look at the uh, benchmark results with no need to queue packets and no need to pass packets through that host upper networking stack, the results are clear. NetKit devices achieve the same throughput for containers as you'd get with native host networking. And the same story is true for latency. Essentially, we are seeing the same networking performance with NetKit as we do when we run applications directly on the host. Support for NetKit has also been added into Cilium. So if you're on a recent enough kernel, 6.6 .6 or above, you can take advantage of this increased network performance by using Cilium as your network plugin and without having to write the eBPF programs yourself to perform host routing. So you can get that zero overhead networking for your containerized applications. And if you want to dive into more details, there's a really good post about it on the iSurveillant blog. I hope you've enjoyed this talk and as performance aficionados, I hope it gives you some other ideas about how maybe eBPF can help to do other things more efficiently and how we can all squeeze more performance out in the areas we care about. I will be online at P99Conf and I really hope you'll have lots of questions for me. Thank you.